Good evening, Bulavinaka and Namaste. This is Fiji Village Straight Talk. I'm VJ Narayan. Tonight, uh, before we start off uh, confirming 5 p.m. this afternoon, the postal ballot applications have closed. And uh, we can give you confirmation that uh, a number of applications, close to about 9,000 applications have come in. Uh, the Supervisor of Elections, Mohammed Sanim, is looking through all the applications that have come in also uh, within the next few hours from all the divisional offices and we'll get uh, full confirmation on numbers in the next few hours. The postal vote uh, applications will be confirmed and people will get uh, their batches and uh, they can vote uh, and uh, return the forms before 6 p.m. December 14th. Uh, the other issue is uh, we've been telling you about that that voting is for majority of the people on December 14th. However, pre-polling will take place in selected areas, selected times between December 5th to December 9th. Uh, Pre-poll areas, please do check. It's on the Elections Office uh, uh, website. There's a lot of areas that are also going through pre-polling, close to about 70,000 people. It was highlighted earlier. And these are the far to reach areas, interior of Viti Levu, interior of Vanu Levu, uh, maritime areas. So quite a number of areas where people will vote before December 14th. Tonight, our guest, the deputy leader of We Unite Fiji Party, Dr. Chone Hawea. Dr. Chone, thank you very much for availing yourself this evening to talk to our viewers and listeners. Uh, we in the Laniau, in a way, Sana Tinkawa and on the Bunua, Ratikasumuna, we Turangambale, Maramambale, as Avambula Saratiguan in Avuver and Kuru Garua, Vera Saranang on Turanganakali. Thank you uh, for everyone. That was uh, Dr. Hawea just uh, saying Bula to everyone from the different provinces and, of course, from uh, the province of Nanunga. And we will talk about that uh, because that's the beginnings of We Unite uh, Fiji Party. Uh, this show provides a background on those who want to lead Fiji over the next four years. They stand on issues that matter to the people, what they will do. It is about accountability and allowing yourself to be held accountable. Dr. Choni, why set up We Unite Fiji Party? The party was set up in Nanunga. What were the main reasons for the setup? And what does the party stand for? The Turangana Kale who founded the party, and uh, this was last year. Um, he had three dreams, and uh, it came as visions in the dream um, that he is to lead the people, uh, that they are being led astray, and uh, he needs to rescue the people. And uh, he needs to, and, and the message came three times. The first time it came, he thought probably it was just because, you know, he was, he was concerned about uh, the Bill 17 and how it went. Uh, but when it came the second and the third time, and then on the occasion of the third time, when he woke up, a purple butterfly flew into his room and landed on his forearm. He took a picture of it and he went and showed it to the spiritual uh, leaders around uh, Valilevu and the elders of Valilevu. And uh, he asked for, you know, what does this mean? And he also mentioned to them about the dreams. In the dream, it told him to set up a party, but do not stand the people will be brought uh, to take the party forward. All he has to do is set it up. And uh, when he consulted the elders and the spiritual uh, leaders, especially with a purple butterfly, uh, the meaning was, you know, uh, purple butterfly color. Purple color is a color of royalty, divine intervention. And the purple butterfly means uh, light in times of darkness. Uh, hope in times of suffering uh, and so they, they said, you know, put it together. The vision and the purple butterfly means you have to follow the vision that's been given to you. 
And so he, he started the party. He went through the party's uh, registration process. Uh, the registration process, you know, we, like all other parties, we had to get 10,000 signatures. That came from all over Fiji, not only from the West. Uh, almost, you know, uh, 2,000 each signatures. The Northern Division had about 1,000 signatures. Interestingly, 60% uh, of those signatures came from the Tikina of Navatu, uh, Mr. Sitiveni Rambuka's Tikina. Uh, and so, because of the, uh, the signatures that came from all over the country, and it showed that there is support to set up the party, and uh, it's because the Ka Turangana Kali was leading, we, it was started. We have a board, two of the vice presidents are women. Uh, one of Indian origin grew up in Nandronga and is a stalwart of the party. Um, we have 20 confirmed candidates. Uh, Mr. Ruveni Nandalo, a uh, former deputy speaker, um, is the party leader. I am the deputy. And we are also fielding a 21-year-old uh, candidate, a uh, medical student, fourth-year medical student uh, from Nandronga of Indian origin. And so uh, uh, we would like to say that we are quite an interesting party uh, with, with a strong leader that's rooted in the Vanuai. Dr. Tsone Hawea, uh, the deputy leader of We Unite Fiji in uh, studio tonight. Many are saying we have nine parties. This will split the votes. Many of the parties will not reach the 5% threshold. What's your comment? Well, it is what it is. That's how the electoral uh, laws are, are set out. And uh, it's, you know, uh, everyone has the right to vote and everyone has the right to set up a party. Uh, if there were 50 applicants and they all met the requirements, there will be 50 parties. It is what it is. That, that's how the electoral... It is are. what it is, but also 5% threshold is a fact. You yes. don't make it. You are out of there. Very true. And that is why from last year, since registration until now, we've been keeping a low profile and just seeing the Vanua of Nandronga Navosa, visiting all the, the households, the connections of, from Nakuru Wakarua, Valilevu uh, of the Turangana Kalevu, and uh, working on our 5% threshold. Uh, because we knew there was going to be more than at least five parties when we were starting out last year. Uh, and so, yes, we knew about that 5% threshold and uh, we were sure to, uh, to uh, work on it. We spent a lot of time and effort uh, working on our 5% threshold from last year. And then from Nandronga Navosa, then we worked, you know, upwards uh, to the relationships in the Vanua, from the connections of uh, Turangana Kaliabu in Serua, in the Sanomba, in the Sanora, in the Sanosonamosi, Naitasiri, and uh, all these uh, Vanua connections are closely connected. Uh, with the Turangana Kalu, and that's what we've been doing, setting up our one more connections. But we made sure that we worked hard on our 5% threshold. So right now we can say for sure, our 5% threshold is secure. That's the feedback that you're getting? That yes. Only 5% or more than 5%? More than 5% actually. But if people are talking, asking us about 5%, we are telling them, our 5% is secure. What about you guys? Dr. Howe, I will go into uh, more details about parties and what happens after yeah. the elections. Yeah. Uh, many know you for opposing COVID vaccines during the pandemic. We do not want to get into, if, into that, if not sure. the whole yeah. show may be consumed by that and we won't have enough time to talk about other issues. Mm. How about, however, what is your stand going forward on no jab, no job and COVID vaccinations? The same... No jab, no job uh, type of uh, law was proposed by Mr. Joe Biden, President of the United States of America, into, uh, you know, uh, 
to, to have this implemented in the US. And this was thrown out uh, last year, late last year, by the US Supreme Court. Now, why, uh, why haven't we heard about that in Fiji? Why, why, why aren't we using that as a reference point? It's the US. This is where a lot of these COVID-19 vaccination regulations and campaign for vaccinations came out from, from the US. And yet, the no job, no job petition by Mr. Joe Biden was thrown out from the US Supreme Court. That is significant enough. We are still challenging uh, the no jab, no job, uh, led by uh, the applicant is Ms. Vasiti Tong. It's before the courts. I cannot yeah. go there. I'm just asking. No, I'm, I'm just saying. Then. I'm just saying uh, that it, it's 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 still there. It's before the courts. Yeah. And uh, this is I'm, what I'm, happened I'm, in I'm, the US. I'm asking you about you as a party. What will you do? I'm not talking about any court case before the court. As a party, what will you be your stand be? going forward on no jab, no job, and COVID vaccination? We will remove the no jab, no job. If we get into parliament, we will remove the no jab, no job. The one question that will follow that is, what about those of us who have been terminated and lost our jobs, resigned, forced to resign, whatever the condition was, because of the no jab, no job law? And there are only two options that the government of the day we'll have to deal with when it comes to this question. Compensation or reinstatement. Right now, by the state of affairs of our country, there's no money to compensate anybody. So if we have to remove the no jab, no job, we'll honestly tell the people there's no money to compensate you. We are sorry, but this is the true state of our country. If we can hold our hands together and accept reinstatement, we can go for reinstatement. Reinstatement will result in more people in the workforce, though, if they have been replaced. If people require reinstatement, a lot of people have gotten on to other jobs. But we have to do something. Justice has to be served. So you will reinstate people rather than compensating? Rather than compensating. Thank you very much. How would you have handled the COVID situation? You mean the vaccination? No, in totality, with the... With the Disease coming in, a new disease coming in, you've got a medical background. Initially, the current administration did not want to close the borders. And the Minister for Health said, this is a small disease, we don't have to worry, the airports do not have to be closed. I agreed with that, because I knew that COVID wasn't much of an issue. It's made out to be a big issue, but it isn't. And the Minister for Health in Parliament stated correctly. So I supported him. And then the Delta variant came. When the Delta variant came, uh, it came from a flight from India. Why was this flight allowed to come in knowing Delta was a hot spot in India? So we know that yes. happened. What would I, you would have, have I would have returned the flight. If I was in power... I would have said that flight turn around. I'm not going to put the whole country at risk for two people coming in to the country, or even if it's a full plane. What's even the if maximum it's number of a plane? Return. Because of the threat. Because of the threat. Then we wouldn't have Delta here. Then we wouldn't have the requirement to do a false full vaccination campaign. It's because we allowed the Delta variant in. That's poor decision-making. When it comes to public health and infectious disease spread, we have to put the country first. And so that plane should not have been allowed to come in. Return, fund them wherever they are returning to. If they are returning back to India or wherever, fund them, fund their accommodation until such time that it is safe, then bring them back in. We will spend less money. We know how much we have spent, how much we've lost because of the closure of the borders and the vaccine and, the, and the, vac the need for vaccination campaign. But it was because we allowed the Delta variant in. You've been in the Western Division. How are things now after the pandemic? 
It is as if nothing has happened. It is as if COVID-19 uh, was something that happened 10 years ago. All of a sudden, everything is open and uh, everyone is allowed to party. All the sports activities have happened, the finals of the deans and all that. And there was no vaccination, um, you know, uh, checks, vaccination status. So what was all that about? And uh, that's, that's a question I'm still asking and I'm sure. Almost 100% of the population in Fiji is asking. What was all that about? Denied entry into the churches. Church pastors getting terminated. And then all of a sudden we are opening things up and everybody's partying. And everyone seems to forget that only a few months ago, there was so much discrimination, stereotyping, stigma, you know, violations of human rights. I was taken by the CID, locked up in the cell, all for what? And now, it's as if nothing has happened. So that's the current status. You have 20 candidates. How many seats are you targeting? We are targeting as many seats as we can get. We are targeting as many votes as we can get. All we are targeting is to have the upper hand when it comes to having the most seats. Because it, we know it's not about how many candidates that's lined up. It's about how many votes that we can get. We have our 5% threshold. Excuse me, that's three, three seats already. All we are going now is as many seats as we can get from as many votes as we can get. Dr. Hawea, what is your stand on Itoke land? Knowing that uh, more than 90% uh, of Itoke land uh, is uh, in the hands of the Itoke and cannot be sold as stated in the 2013 constitution. Six, six feet of Itoke land is owned by the Itoke. That's what you just referred to. When you say 90% uh, of the land is owned by the Itoke, it means surface to six feet. Below six feet is owned by the state. Why should that be owned by the state? Who is the state? It used to be owned by the crown. Then we took it away from the crown in the 1987 coup. So now it belongs to an entity called the state. And the 2013 constitution defines clearly who the state is. And the state is just the government officers that we the people put there. And therefore they now own six feet below. And what is in six feet below? It's everything from precious metals to non-precious metals to minerals to oil. You never know what kind of natural resources is sitting under there. That is owned by the state. The Itaukei okay people are saying that belongs to us. The constitution or whatever laws that state, it needs to state that. Come back to us, the original owners. The crown of England took that. Yes, we understand. That's a decision we can't uh, go back in time and change. But we have got it back. Why isn't it returned fully to the owner? We'll talk about the constitution because you have said that you, that's one of the things you will do, looking at changes. It's okay land, uh, issue about utilization, be it for agricultural purposes or other investments. From your perspective, how can you unleash this potential? What are your plans? Currently, a lot of it's okay land sit on the boundaries that you know the British set as rural and there are town boundaries where all the development activities are happening in. Why? Because there's a law that says town and country planning. There is no law that says rural planning. You cannot set up a commercial activity on your land, Matangali land by default of the fact that there is no law that describes planning that will describe 
that will prescribe the development activity. If you want to set up a commercial activity, you'll have to bring it to town where there are allocations of land to do commercial activity in. Why do you think we have so much rural to urban drift? It's because these are the development activities that are allowable by law. By default of the laws that the English people have set up. And we have never bothered to just have a review of that. You open up the boundaries. Why, why, you know, the British were discriminatory against the Itoki people. Town boundaries in, in the Fijian dialect is Koropakapalangi, the village of the white people, of the British. And they made the laws to develop themselves. While we, the Itoki, we have to make our own food paths, do, you know, uh, create our own power supply, work hard and get money to put in water to all our villages. Our development, we are doing it ourselves. Yet we are all taxpayers. Rural areas, uh, uh, what about places like Fiji water? Those are out of the town areas? Whenever you want to set up a commercial activity in a rural area, there has to be a conversion of the type of land you are doing on. You cannot do it on a straightforward Matangali land. So what's, Just your, what's, by default. Your, what's your thinking? How, how can you change that? Review the law. Review the law. Review the law. There needs to be a, a review of all the acts that have been sitting from and this the colonial the, days. This is the feedback you're getting when you're going out uh, in, on your campaign trail about... People this is the talking feedback about this? I'm getting. This is the experience that I had. I worked uh, at Friend. I was the associate director for six years. We did, we reached out to the whole country in terms of the programs that we did, development programs, income generating programs. And this is the main challenge. You want to create a huge commercial activity to do income generating for a certain community and you are stuck with the boundaries of the law in what you are able to do and what you are unable to do by default of the laws and you cannot you know go beyond that no matter what kind of policies you are putting in the borders of the boundaries of the law are, are this it's stringent it's rigid so if you come in you look at changes for that review the laws reorientate the law Make it enabling. Sugarcane is the only commodity that has the value chain established from farm to market. The only commodity out of the land that has a well-established value chain from farm to market. And it was established by the British because they had been trading for hundreds of years before they came here. So they knew the importance that's why the Itoki Land Trust Act was established to allow for leasing of land for sugarcane plantations. Access road was made. The harvesting, there's a, there's a harvesting, cane cutting rules. Then you have transportation, the tram line, the trucks. Then you have a processing factory, the mills. Then you have a market. We went and established the Lomi Convention, the price of sugar. One crop. Prices, yeah. One crop. Cassava, Ndalo, Uvi, Kumala, Vundi, Coconut, Roro, Ota. We have this in abundance. It's mango season. Where is the value chain for all of this? None. Why? Because these are things that are growing in the rural areas. It's time we review the laws. It's time we set up the value chain. The government, it's the government's duty to set up this. Just like the British did. We have the sugarcane there as a perfect example of a perfect value chain. And we haven't learned from that. Every, every farmer, every Ndalo farmer, you know, if, if a, if a sugarcane farmer has 10 acres of sugarcane, he is sure that that 10 acres of sugarcane is going to the market. Relatively, a Ndalo farmer who has 2 acres of Ndalo has no idea how much they are going to earn from that. Because he has to take care of all that. Transportation, harvesting. Some people might harvest before him. On the way to the exporter, importer. 
Thank you, Dr. Hawea. We will we'll be back after this break. What I did in 2006 is to clean up the mess we started. When there has been Itoke leadership, everybody has been embraced. He cannot stomach the fact that he is not in government. You said that you couldn't pay out bonuses, but this shows an increase in board directors' fees. For any you, person, you are wanting to lead the country, not me. For any, I'm asking you the question again, back to corporal punishment. Right. What's your stand on it? Fiji First Buy cannot it. intervene into a personal matter. Absolutely you can for small you businesses. Can't. I was very uh, surprised when he came out with that statement that I would conduct a coup if I lose. Not Hand me. on your heart. It's him. No, you're a joke. Uh, no, yes. you are a joke. You're a joke. You're a joke. You're a joke. Don't bring it up. We don't no, no, I'm going to bring it up. You were commander. But yes, Every but military officer and serviceman at the time was under your... You've forgotten you trade them. Bulovinaka, this is Fiji Village Street Talk. I'm VJ Narai. Fiji Village Trade Talk with VJ Narayan, sponsored by Salt and Pepper Home Decor, living in high quality. Watch it live on the Fiji Village Facebook page. Download the all new Fiji Village app. Get the latest news direct to your mobile. Get the latest sports updates from our scoreboards online. Navigate easily through our categories. Watch videos from Straight Talk interviews, local music videos, sports and many more. You can now easily listen to your favorite radio stations from your phone. Download the all-new Fiji Village app right now. Welcome back. This is Fiji Village Straight Talk. I'm VJ Narayan. Tonight in studio, the deputy leader of the We Unite Fiji Party, Dr. Chone Hawea, and discussions before this, of course, about how you can unleash the potential of all that Itoke land. Dr. Hawea is saying they will be looking at reviewing of laws uh, where the rural land has been locked because of uh, archaic laws, as he has put it. Uh, Dr. Hawea. Fiji First General Secretary Ayar Said Kayum says, if a loan taken out by a tenant on a leased Itoke land cannot be paid and the bank does a mortgagee sale, it will be a mortgagee sale for the balance of the lease period and the land will not be lost forever. However, the People's Alliance leader, Mr. Sitiviri Rambuka says, the issue is clear that the Itoke Land Trust Amendment Budget Amendment Act of 2021, which was Bill Number 17, came through no consultation with the Itoke landowners and removed the requirement of obtaining the consent of Itoke Land Trust Board for any mortgagee, charge, pledge, caveat on a lease under the Act or any such lease to be dealt with by any court of law. I know it is a contentious issue for your party. What's your stand on this? We would like to take a step further than all those discussions. The reason why we are on to the, uh, why we are discussing the review of all laws is we would like to review the Itoke Land Trust Act. Uh, because the purpose of the Itoke Land Trust Act was for the business of agro-business, it, it was agriculture business, the commodity being sugarcane, and it was for the white person, it was for the British. And Itoke landowners then did not know the value of the land in, in business, and you know, you were still under the British rule, and so it has served its purpose for the British in trying to do an income generating means for the country. That we understand and we know. But we are now asking the questions. Why aren't we at least reviewing the law so that it becomes a pro-landowner instead of a pro-tenant setup, which is the purpose of the whole institution? 
So you, you believe the thinking is just wrong at the moment, that the landowners are not being given the chance we are fighting over to utilize the land? We are fighting over breadcrumbs. You're talking about lease money? Lease or you're money. Talking, oh, yeah, I'm talking about, about lease money. What about landowners utilizing their own land, getting into it where, themselves? Where does the landowner get the capital from? I, I'm asking to, you. To, I mean, to lease their own land. A lot of landowners would like to utilize their land. Where do they get the capital from? By default of their landowner status, that should mean something. Land is the most valuable asset. It appreciates all the time. And yet the owner of the land does not get to negotiate on the main business negotiating table. I am the landowner. You come with your lease ideas and your business ideas and your finance investment. Let's make a deal. I get to have a cut from the main profit, not from lease money. That's where we should be looking at. So you, what about the setup of TLTB? The setup of TLTB is fine. It's an infrastructure that can be repurposed. We are talking about repurposing. Repurposing, so lease, no lease, or premium lease. You would have to, in the, in the, in the situation where the landowner becomes the investor, co-investor, because the landowner is putting, excuse me, is putting the land on the table. We do business. The function of government is to make the business work, is to look for the market, is to set up the value chain, is to negotiate prices, to look after this negotiation, to look after this deal. So you the will whole, open that up? Yes. That's what we will... Uh, How confident are you? Because whenever people talk about Ito K land, uh, there's a fear also that comes in, that they may lose it. But There's always fear of a change, uh, Vijay. Whenever you propose a change, there's always fear. How will people you fear change, naturally. It's, it's, the Ito K people, compared to back then, are now well educated. In all provinces, Tikina villages, Matangali Toka Toka. The Itoke people are educated, experienced, they've seen the world, they are managing huge businesses, they are leading the charge, they're team leaders. They have land. And they have land. Which is not being utilized. Which is not being utilized. And the law does not allow us to manage our own land, to be co investors in our own land. It was set up so that we continue to receive leases and fight over lease money. This lease is like this, this is this lease is like this. We are fighting over 50 cents, 60 cents in lease. Well, Population has increased. I want to change it a bit. Uh, Mark McElrath has a question. How will you fix hospitals in your medical opinion? The hospitals, like I said, when the British set up this country, town boundaries, towns, rural areas. And that's how it has been. Half of the country's population live between Nabua and Nosori Corridor, roughly, and only one hospital is serving it. How do you think it will hold up? Naturally, it will collapse because there's just too many people for those so many facilities. It's about time we think differently. Why can't we organize ourselves into provinces? Why can't we put major hospitals in each province? You distribute, but then you will have to distribute the population first. In order for that to happen, you need commercial activities, industrial activities in all these areas. So that there's a reverse shift of people. But short, short term, You'll have to put your money where your mouth is. Put money into renovating the hospitals. Renovating what? Everything. Give examples. You, you're a medical doctor. What is, what, what, based, on priori based on priority. You know, um, people are being told not to take pictures from the corridors to the wards to the operating theatre. Um, Everything is falling apart, you know, and all we are doing is saying, putting up a billboard that we are going to uh, reconstruct and, 
and uh, you know refurbish the CWM hospital. Lately, we refurbished the billboard. That's all we did. That's all the government has been doing. A lot of NGOs have come and taken it upon themselves to do renovation work. What did the government do? Stop them. Why aren't we doing that for our people when we know that half of the population of this country depend on this one hospital? If it's like that, then we improve the status of the other hospitals in Nakasi. Make them tertiary hospitals so that the same services that are offered here in CWM can be in Nakasi. We erect another one in Nosori. This is the corridor that needs help. We need to redistribute the load. The staff here in CWM are overworked. I have been working there. I have worked there and we worked 48 hours straight and three times a week. That's what happens. Why? Population. So if we want to re redistribute that, redistribute the centers. There's only one tertiary hospital in this whole area. This one. A divisional level. All the rest are subdivision and they lack all the other facilities like x-ray, lab and all those essentials. Equip those bigger hospitals so they have the same Things like, things, things like cath lab equipment, we do, we, we've been getting donations, what we've been told by uh, Dr. Vijay Kapadia, he's been... Uh, Let's do Australia. the simple things first. But the simple that. things first. Uh, we I'm can't asking you about equipment like those because <laughs> heart patients rely on that. A lot of people cannot afford it. Yes, it, it makes sense that only one centre has that. Why? Because the population of heart patients is not that much. It's the other conditions that demand the most health services. Diabetes, diabetic amputations. I have been on to diabetic amputations for 10 years now. I now have figured out an approach. I'm now saving legs instead of allowing them to get amputated. And it's simple approaches. Nutrition, wound management. We have to get back to the basics and do it right. Yes, have a cath lab here. Because the population of heart patients that require cath lab is only this much. That makes sense. But for the rest, the common things that occur commonly distribute the services so that the people have access, accessibility, availability, affordability. Let's talk about NCDs. You've done some work on that mm. and you've just touched on that. Yeah. Accessibility, affordability, what needs to be done? What will you do? From the beginning of this year, I have saved 57 patients in a self-funded program that I'm doing from being amputated, even though they were diagnosed. My mainstay, of course, is nutrition, healthy nutrition. NCDs share the same common risk factors, one of those main ones being nutrition. Now I have reversed diabetes and I have reversed the infection to the extent that it looks like nothing happened at all and that was done without any major surgery at all. Mainstay was nutrition but I am promoting through my patients I am telling them no more processed food because we need to have your bodies clear of all the chemicals that are bombarding your body and making you sick. Only local food and nutrition and the families have to f get that but that's the main challenge right there. Accessibility, availability, and affordability of healthy food, nutritious food. One bundle of Roro will cost somebody in Suva around $3. One packet of noodles, five pack noodles, is cheaper than that. As a family, as a head of a family, with this much money only around Suva, I will go for the five pack noodles knowing that it does not give me much nutrition, but it's what I can afford. Because that bundle of Roro, that's $3, that can only feed one person. At least the five-pack noodles will feed the, feed the family. Accessibility, availability, affordability. We want all those healthy food that's available in our jungle, the otter, the Roro, the watercress, all these root crops, fruits and vegetables. But then you uh, then 
going into value chain. How does it make its way from there to each and every plate in each and every home? Which means we'll have to redirect our ideas of where these things are available. The supermarket, no one, not many people have access, accessibility to the supermarket every day for their food every day. The how supermarket, will, how, the daily shop. How will you ensure that all this produce comes to the main areas? Set up, need them? set up, review the laws first so that our Itaukei people can be enabled. Support the value chain, establish farm roads, collection centers, distribution centers, establish markets all over the densely populated areas where people can have direct access to subsidize a lot of these costs as we have been doing for sugarcane subsidize these things so that the cost is reduced so that one bundle of roro can at least be sold at 75 cents then you and i can enjoy targeted timelines for this because definitely it's a mammoth ask at the moment but it has to start based Just to on start from your suggestion and the first task is to review the law Without reviewing the law and repurposing it and reorienting it, you cannot begin the other processes. Let's talk about taxes and duties. Uh, have you looked into that? We, uh, will you make any changes? You talked about some of the foods that are not good for the people, according to your assessment. Yes. Uh, will you? Will you? There was an increase in tax. Duties? There was an increase in tax done uh, in the last several years on sugar sweetened beverages, and that was supposed to. Uh, reduce the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages, you know, uh, uh, the carbonated drinks and all. And so that was supposed to be the answer to increase, you know, to reduce the, the drinking of this soda and uh, carbonated drinks. But it didn't, it, it gained a lot of tax. Yes, we earned a lot of money, but people still bought it. Why? There's no alternative. If you want people to drink these type of unhealthy drinks, then provide the alternative. What was the alternative that they were talking about back then? Water. Come on. You know, people like to drink juice. If you want to take away one type of juice, then provide the alternative as a juice. We have abundance of fruits year in and year out. They are rotting on the ground. Look at the mangoes that we are having in season. There is nothing that at least creates value-added products, healthy juices. But then we come again to establishing this value chain, the processing of these juices. Why can't it happen in the rural areas where there is an abundance of it? And make it available as an alternative to our people. I'm going back to the taxes and duties. Have you thought of what you will increase, what you will decrease? Because that makes government revenue. Basic items, we would like to give it back to zero tax. Basic items. Zero tax, zero duty? Zero tax, zero tax. VET. The, the because vet. at the end of the day, the people are going to foot whatever taxation increase will, will put. Whether it's duty or tax, at the end of the day, the customers are going to foot that bill. You, you will look at the list of uh, basic items that are zero rated at the moment? Will you expand on it? We'll, we'll have a look at the, uh, the basic items that were there before. We'll have to review those items first and then uh, see which ones need to be added, uh, whether we need to expand the list or we start off because you know, we, we are going from, um, you haven't we are, we'll you have haven't to go back to them, zero tax. You haven't reviewed them as yet? No, 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 no we haven't. We haven't. Um, when you we, mean the when, list when, when, to, when whether to expand that? or Please, yeah, to... Whether to expand? No, no. Okay. No. When will you be able to tell the people? First of all, we... Our, our health products, there's, there's a need, on one side, there's taxations. There's one aspect 
of food entering the country that we are not looking at, and that is the quality and the chemical content of food entering the country. These are things that will have to be... We have no Food and Drug Administration, administration Institution like what some of these countries have. So you'll assess that and then decide on the text. And then decide. Thank you very much, Dr. Hawea. We'll be back after this break. Bulovinaka, I'm Vijay Narayan. As Fiji goes to the polls, we at Fiji Village are committed to bringing you fair, accurate and balanced coverage of the issues that matter. Visit the Fiji Votes 2022 section on Fiji Village for all the latest on the 2022 Fijian general elections. Download the all-new Fiji Village app right now. Welcome back. This is Fiji Village Straight Talk. I'm Vijay Narayan. Our guest tonight, we unite Fiji Party Deputy Leader, Dr. Chone Hawea. Dr. Hawea, let's talk about education. People are asking, what's your stand on uh, fee-free education, uh, TELS loans and toppers? Will you maintain the current programs? Will you amend them? Will you remove any? Well, I am a result of, uh, you know, my, I got my uh, doctor's degree through a scholarship. It was a Fiji government uh, scholarship. I, I had a Fijian Affairs Board scholarship when I was in Form 7. So what was wrong with that? And so why, why put students under so much pressure by putting them on a loan when they haven't even earned money and the surety of getting an employment is almost nil because of the job opportunities and the employability rate of uh, people who are coming out of our tertiary institutions. Um, and so, we will have to do away with TELS. TELS is just putting loans and strangling the necks of the already struggling people. So they no, have to pay back these loans. No student loans? No student loans. We'll have to go get back to scholarships. How many scholarships will you be giving in a year? You know, this is a question about how well we can reorientate the economy, build the local economy, so that we are able to really provide true free education. And the only way to do that is to improve the primary sectors. And then again, we are going back into agriculture, fisheries. First of all, the Itoke need to own the Ngolingoli first before we can be enabled and accommodated to improve the economy through the fisheries. You know that we do not own the Ngolingoli as it okay. It's owned by the state. We only have, as it okay people, the customary right to fish. You cannot block anyone from going out no. to your area. No, because the state owns that. And so if we want to provide free education, we need to get the money from somewhere. You have to improve the local economy. We'll, we'll go to that uh, issue about changes made to the constitution, but what will you do? 
I mean, uh, what's your message to the younger people of this country who are finishing off secondary school, planning for their tertiary education? What's your message? They're watching you at the moment. Next year, what's the scholarship criteria for you? We How will do it. We will take away the loan. And when we come in, we will have to, if we are saying uh, discount, then we will have to start the discount now. If we say we are going to reimburse the loan, we'll have to start the process of reimbursing now, not make promises. But we do not want people to be on the loan, so we'll take it out altogether. That's the, ones, that's the ones that people that have signed already, that tells loans that they're people who have gone into the programs and have the loans. Yes. What about the new ones? What do you have for the students? What's the plan going out into the new year, the students who are leaving secondary school education and will be going into tertiary education, what will you have for them? Scholarships. The scholarship units and uh, how it used to function is still not uh, archaic yet. The processes of uh, doing uh, bondage and, you know, I, I only had to work for the government for certain years. So scholarships for everyone who comes out? What's, the, what's your plan? We want to educate. Our, we have set ourselves the standard, the, the motto of uh, knowledge. You know, education for all. Yes. Scholarships for that all. That means... As long as you get uh, your entry into the university, you'll be given a scholarship. We'll then have to review what are we educating our children on and for what purpose. No, I'm asking the criteria that uh, how, how will you do it for some... It has to be worked out on that way, uh, Vijay. We've been doing it like just giving scholarships, getting people educated, and then you have... You said a, a population of criteria? qualifications. Yes, we'll have to review the curriculum. What is it serving? If we want to, because these things need to be interconnected. The agriculture sector, the forestry sector, the fishery sector, that we want to develop. Train our students to fit into that sector so that there is a direction in which the free education is headed towards. How much we need to improve trade. How much funding will you allocate to this uh, scholarship? We cannot talk about funding unless we talk about uh, the shifting and reorientation of laws. And then policies will then come and then the budgets will then come. So you'll it. talk numbers after? After. Review Wait. the laws. After review the, the laws. After review the, the structure. After the election? You'll talk after numbers the after the election. Yes. What is your stand? Otherwise, uh, we'll make false promises. I don't want you to make false promises. I'm just asking you because there's people wanting to know. Masood Shah, what's your party's view about reinstating USP funding? A question from Masood Shah. We condemn what this government did to Professor Alwalia and we condemn the non-accountability status that they stood on. Uh, that is a violation of human rights and we will see to it that the USP funding gets reinstated and we continue our relationship with our Pacific neighbours who have helped build the institution over the years and helped educate our people. We will get that back. Now I'm talking uh, about this budget, the 2022-2023 national budget, uh, Dr. Hawea. Government debt was estimated at around $9.1 billion or 89.4% of GDP at the end of July this year. The Minister for Economy, Aya Said Kayum, has said in two years, the government lost about $2.8 billion in revenue during the pandemic. How will you deal with government debt if you are saying there's too much borrowing, what will you change? What are your targeted debt levels? Can you please lay it out for the people? The current, uh, the current approach is tourism. A lot has been put into tourism. Now we know from uh, years back that uh, a report came out of the Reserve Bank that every, in every dollar that comes into our tourism industry, only 40 cents is in Fiji. How can we improve on that so that much of that dollar is here. And one main factor is food. 
that is served in our hotels, we are importing 95% of that. How can we, we will put down the structures, the value chains that enables the agriculture sector to provide for this tourism sector. We can't help the fact that everything has been established and directed towards tourism. We can now only start to try and feed it better. Remove the import bill with regards to the tourism industry. What will be your projected debt levels? It's already 9.1 billion Again, as July we will not uh, go into trying to promises, make promises on, on projected debt levels. Numbers will come after the numbers elections. Numbers will come after elections. Now, are you planning to bring back the Great Council of Chiefs? And what form should it return in? And do you think it still has a place in Fijian society? Our main question is why was it removed in the first place? And we know that there was, you know, statements made that the Great Council of Chiefs was corrupted. Uh, where is the result of the investigation of that corruption? What was, what was the outcome of it? We haven't seen any, any chief being sentenced to jail for the corruption which was labelled for its removal. Okay, we move forward now. There is nothing in the 2013 constitution that says that the Great Council of Chiefs has a function in the governance of the Itoki people. So the Itoki are governed by the Minister for Itoki, as in the 2013 constitution. So where is the role of our chiefs in the law? None. So I'm asking you, what will you do? Will you bring it back? In what form will you bring it back, if you do? If we have to bring it back, then we'll have to change the constitution. First, because there's nothing in there that says the Great Council of Chiefs has a role. So under, if we have to start talking about bringing the, uh, the Great Council of Chiefs, we'll then have to start talking about the very thing we are talking about now. We'll have to do something about the constitution. Why? Because the immunity clause is there, which protects the biggest crime and the biggest corruption of all, a coup, and the abuse of authority of that position attained by the coup to put the immunity clause there and protect criminals. Dr. Hawea, changing of the constitution requires 75% of support of in members parliament. of parliament and 75% of support of registered voters in a referendum. Yes. You know that takes a lot of work. Yes. How will you do it? First, talked about get into this. parliament. And then? Get into parliament. Get as many seats as we can. We have 75% of the population as Itoki. And also, the coup was a rape of the whole nation. The Itoki does not make 75% of the population, Dr. Hawea. Yes, it is close to that. Close to that. Close to that. Yes. 60%, around 60, 65%. Roughly. So. If you look at the voters' population, it's close to 75%. Now, I'm asking you the question, how will you get around? You have 20 candidates. Yeah. Even if you, all, all of you go in, mm. you still do not make the Then majority, we have the upper majority. hand. Then we have the upper hand at allocating seats and coalition with other parties, provided they are aligned with the cause. Once you have that many seats in parliament and you win it through elections, through votes, you have the upper hand at allocation of seats. Yes, we are ready to work with other parties because we have so many respected candidates in the other parties. But those other parties also have coup makers in them and we will never align ourselves with lawlessness. So you will not work with the... We'll, we'll come to that question. Civil servants pay contracts, retirement age and conditions. People are asking, what's your stand on that? Retirement age, currently at 55. Civil servants pay, people are asking, do you have any plans for the civil servants? Again, we, we, we are now going to touch on laws. Before we used to have the Public Service Commission. There's no more of that. And that used to be the accountability institution within the civil service. 
if we want to talk about the civil service, then we'll have to bring back the Public Service Commission because that stands as the accountability under of the policies. Con and under laws. the Constitution, the Public Service Commission is there. It's only they, they appoint permanent secretaries. So you are saying the permanent sec uh, per public, the public service, service commission, commission as, as in the past. As an institution. As in the past, in how the past. it dealt with all civil yes. service. And after that, do you expect to review the retirement the, age The retirement service? age, you know, uh, jobs that require trade, specific trade, like medical professionals, like myself. It is, I, I have no idea how they came up with the, the decision to retire people at 55. That's when people are at their peak of especially the trades, the trades people, people with uh, special skills like surgeons, uh, mechanics, engineers. These are the ones that you need to keep them in the service so that they train. They train the younger leaders and once they know they are ready, when they are ready, then they slowly take them out. They are there as consultants, keep them there. These are experienced trades people. What will take me two hours to do an experienced person like that. So you'll just change take the retirement minutes. age? You'll change the retirement change age? Change the retirement to age. What? We'll have to look at it and it has to be specified to what? according to trades. Oh, so it'll be based on yes. different trades, different retirement age? Different retirement age. Do you but have, do you longer than 55. Longer than 55 for everyone? Before it used to be 60, we'll have to look at both the years of 60 and 65. And make the decisions come when after you elections. After elections. Yes. Now, let's be realistic. How many seats are you targeting? How many seats are you planning to win? You, you're saying 5% threshold? As many seats as we can. We never reduce ourselves to a number. Okay. If it comes to negotiations, and this goes back to who you can work with. You said yeah. you can work with parties, but you do not want to work with coup makers. Yeah. So who can you work with? Which parties can you work with? Can you work with Fiji first? We can work with candidates. No, no, you have to work with parties because parties form coalitions to run no. government. So can you no. work with Fiji first? Before elections? No. After elections, if the people have put them in there, then yes, we will be ready to work with them. Because it is now after the people's choice. It's different before elections. We'll stand on our own ground and not allow lawlessness to be, we will not align with it. Corruption and crime of the coup. After elections, if the people have voted them in there, there's no other choice to follow the mandate given by the people. So you basically will be open to negotiation with Fiji First, People's Alliance? To all parties, because all. whoever is, has won a seat, has won a seat because people put them there. Some parties have said we'll work with some, not work with others. You don't have that stand. You have a stand before going into before election. Going into before elect going to election, you're telling voters, yeah. we will not work with coup makers. After elections, you can. You can, because it's after the people's choice. The people make government. Government is of the people, for the people. And so if the people have chosen this, who are we to deny the people of their choice? Dr. Hawe, I thank you very much for your time, uh, uh, for coming this evening. I know you've been busy in your campaign meetings, uh, making yourself available, making your party known. We Unite Fiji Party, what you stand for. Uh, from uh, Nanonga and uh, also uh, continuing your campaign meetings from now until uh, 7.30 uh, a.m. Uh, December 12th when uh, the blackout period starts and uh, as we've said that uh, pre-polling starts from December 5th uh, to, uh, and runs through till December 9th. Uh, tomorrow we, had, uh, we still have a slot left for the Fiji First. We uh, sent out invites to all parties and we've kept that slot for tomorrow night. Unfortunately, I cannot confirm to you right now on whether they will take the slot. Uh, we have been waiting for them as uh, a party that's in government to come 
uh, to talk about what they stand for and what will they be doing. And uh, it is all about accountability and allowing yourself to be held accountable and uh, uh, the messages coming through from people, the questions being asked. So we will give you a confirmation. Keep a lookout on our platforms. Next week, uh, on uh, Wednesday, 30th November, we have a panel discussion on the economy and uh, issues surrounding that. Uh, Wednesday, uh, sorry, Tuesday, 6th December, uh, discussion on women. Uh, and uh, Thursday, 8th December, uh, discussion on the youth. And then uh, we round off things uh, at 7 p.m. on December 11th. We'll be uh, giving you details as they come along. And uh, you have a great evening. Stay with us. Stay looking at our platforms. We'll keep you updated. Have a great evening.